So that was our uh, final panel with chairs. I hope you uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, this now leads us to definitions as opposed to directions, definitions of what um, slasher studies might actually uh, be. So I've forgotten what the actual panel's called, which is why I'm diverting. Um, directions, um, definitions for slasher studies, genre, theory, discipline, really messed that one up. And for this, I shall now bring in my um, four speakers with whom I will be in a round table discussion with. So we have Wickham Clayton, Dr. Steve Jones, Dr. Murray Leader, and Professor Joan Hawkins. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I would say it's late, but I think, again, this like a crazy time zone panel. So it's late, yeah. it's early, it's kind of afternoon. Um, so before we get into our discussion, I will uh, introduce everybody um, one by one. So Dr. Wickham Clayton is a lecturer in film production at the University for the Creative Arts. He is also co-organizer of the Slasher Studies Summer Camp. Um, Wickham's the author of See, Hear, Cut, Kill, Experiencing Friday the 13th, and co-editor of Screening Twilight, Critical Approaches to a Cinematic Phenomenon, as well as the forthcoming Don't Look Back, Our Nostalgia for Horror and Slasher Films. He's also editor of Style and Form in the Hollywood Slasher Film. We also have Professor Joan Hawkins. Uh, Joan Hawkins is a professor in cinema and media studies at Indiana University Bloomington. She is the author of Cutting Edge, Art Horror and the Horrific Avant-Garde and has written extensively on horror and experimental cinema. She is currently working um, on a book on indie horror. Uh, Dr. Steve Jones. Steve Jones is senior lecturer in media and film at Northumbria University UK and adjunct research professor in law and legal studies at Colton University Canada. His research principally focuses on sex, violence, ethics and selfhood within horror and pornography. Steve's the author of Torture Porn, Popular Horror After Saw, and his work has been published in Feminist Media Studies, New Review of Film and Television Studies, Sexualities, and Film Philosophy. He's also on the editorial board um, for Porn Studies for Journal. And then we finally have Dr. Murray Leader. Uh, Murray Leader is a research affiliate at the University of Manitoba's Institute for the Humanities. Um, he is the author of Horror Film, A Critical Introduction, The Modern Supernatural and the Beginnings of Cinema, as well as The Devil's Advocate um, Halloween. Um, and he, um, Murray is also editor of Cinematic Ghosts, Haunting and the Spectrality from Silent Cinema to the Digital Era and Refocus, the films of William Castle. He has published in such journals as Horror Studies, the Canadian Journal of Film Studies, the Journal of um, Popular Culture, the Journal of Popular Film and Television, um, Film Journal and the Journal of Communication and Languages. Again, thank you um, all for coming to join us in this concluding, closing roundtable discussion for the Slasher Studies um, summer camp. Um, just trying to find my questions. <laughs> um, so, um, I'm sure everyone's heard this story at some point during the past three days, but this was originally supposed to be an easy one day symposium. Lo and behold, it's turned into a spectacular three day conference. Um, but really the reason as to why Wickham and I ended up turning this into a three-day conference is, well, number one, we had a huge amount of abstracts and we realized that these abstracts were so important that they really, you know, couldn't, we, we, we were too emotionally connected to them, we couldn't get rid of them. Now, what's actually really interesting in this idea of emotional connection um, within abstracts and academia is the fact that what was so clear in all of these abstracts is that whilst people are engaging with slasher films as academics, there's also a certain element of autoethnography within it. Um, 
people write about slasher films in an academic context because they genuinely love these films. And obviously when you're writing about slasher films and you love them, sometimes it's very difficult to kind of be objective as opposed to subjective. There's an awful lot of play here. And so therefore it's really um, something that we instantly need to consider, not just for the people on this round table, but kind of horror studies and slasher studies even more broadly is this consciousness about the fact that, you know, we're not just spectators, but indeed fans of these films. Um, so by way of introduction, Ben, um, I've already introduced you with your bios, but each of you individually, um, could you each tell us briefly about your personal interest in the slasher subgenre, what your research and scholarship focuses on, and what you feel is the enduring relevance of slasher? Given that Wickham is <laughs> my co-organizer, he will have an idea as well in terms of mindset, my mindset here. So I will um, start off with Wickham. I mean, autoethnography is absolutely right. Um, I, I, I've been very open, uh, especially in, in the See Here Cut Kill, which was based on my PhD thesis. Um, I, I open it with, you know, deeply autoethnographical uh, account about me coming to Friday the 13th, but the slasher in general, uh, as a fan uh, for my sins. Uh, and and as, as a kid, I found horror terrifying. I couldn't watch it even though I was like deeply immersed in um, uh, the the aesthetic, the uh, in, like rich imagery of, I, I remember sitting in my elementary school library uh, with this book that was in there on Dracula for some reason and just marveling over those old like Vlad the Impaler woodcuts. <laughs> thought they were just phenomenal and beautiful and I kept coming back to them even though I got very creeped out. Um, I sort of like got back into film in my late teenage years when I saw Clockwork Orange for the first time at age 17. And it made me think there's a way of actually engaging with films and in an interesting way that they're doing something that isn't kind of just pre-written. There's an, uh, there's an idea, there's a development, there's a consciousness behind the creation of, of film. And then I kind of said, all right, I need to see everything the Stanley, Stanley Kubrick guy's done. Uh, and then ended up watching The Shining. Uh, it scared the shit out of me. And uh, it's one of my favorite films. Um, but uh, from there, I just created this this deep fascination with horror um, really uh, impacted me and affected me. And I wanted to see what the most sort of ground level CD stuff that I was hearing about when I was a kid, uh, again, in elementary school, people telling me uh, my age at five and six years old about Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, that they clearly hadn't seen, um, but they wanted to pretend that they'd seen because they thought it was cool. Um, I was a kid in the eighties, so yeah. Um, but but uh, that said, uh, yeah, I, I fell in love with it. And it all goes back to that original uh, connection to the aesthetic, to the feeling, the texture of, uh, of the material. And that's, that's partly my draw toward form in my research. Um, but also as I've uh, read more and had conversations with people, my interest in form has also become, uh, I think, more nuanced uh, and, and interested in these other angles um, and and uh, the the uh, sociological uh, aspects and impacts of of these films, um, which I, I I don't feel entirely confident confident speaking uh, authoritatively about, but you know that's kind of why you get my diatribe at the beginning of the conference. Um, have I talked long enough? I'm sorry. <laughs> but... Talk as long as you like. We've got a while. Um... <laughs> Steve, would you like to go ahead next? We'll go across. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I, I'm also a kid of the 80s. So for, for me, like horror is slasher and vice versa, because I, I just grew up on that stuff. I mean, one of my earliest sort of memories of engaging with film and really thinking about film is going into a video shop back in the day being as high as the counter i'm only five or something but on the counter is that that poster the graham humphreys poster for um elm street 2 and it's as big as me and i was just fascinated by you know who is freddie why does he want to take revenge why is he burning a school bus and right for me that was sort of one of those sort of seminal moments and um, so I've, i was obsessed with horror 
from a, a very young age and started watching from a very young age. And it, I suppose it wasn't until um, I was doing my undergraduate um, at Leicester, I did um, my backgrounds in English literature studies originally. And just during downtime, when I was supposed to probably be reading Pride and Prejudice, which is the only book I didn't finish um, during my time at Leicester, um, I was cruising around in the library and found, uh, I, th I think it was um, Vera Dika's book, though I may be misremembering that, but finding the section, the very small section that they had at the time in Leicester Library uh, about um, horror and thought, oh, you can actually do this and you you can get away with doing this is what i thought at the time not in a kind of this uh, research is bad in a kind of i didn't realize you were allowed to do this and then that kind of changed my life from that point on i changed direction um but my i come to the slasher really from an interest when i started in horror studies of connecting sex and death and then it sort of spiraled into my previous interests from that point so that's that's me. I like the fact that we both had an abject fascination with that VHS cover art of um, Freddy's Revenge because I remember going to car boots and yard sales and being like, oh my God, what is that image? Um, and then I had another awakening after whatever I watched it. <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> um, Joan, I will pass over the mic to you now. Okay, so um, th continuing the autoethnographic uh, trend. I have kind of two roots. For Well, for one thing, I'm a child of the 60s. So when I became first interested in horror, it was Bava that drew me in. And it was uh, um, the Gothic that I loved. Um, and sort of academically, I came to horror very much through Gothic literature. It was a fascination with, uh, with Dracula. And, and it became very clear to me when I was working on my on my doctorate in literature that the place where female sexuality was treated seriously and given some kind of voice, albeit horrific, albeit a horrific one, was in, um, was in horror literature. And so I became very interested in that. My, my large overarching um, academic project is, is taste politics. And so I come to, um, and, and I'm a kind of classic case of that. So, you know, I'm very influenced by Pierre Bourdieu and this notion that we're actually taught what we think is in good taste and what's in bad taste. And that, and that we're taught through a very kind of precise methodology that's reflected in our schools and that the, um, and that it has a class bias. And so that we're all, we're all educated into middle class, upper middle class taste culture, essentially, whatever else has been going on in our lives. And, um, and in my own personal life, I can see that very clearly. Um, my, both my parents were working class. Uh, neither of my parents graduated from high school. And I'm the first person, my brother was the first person in our family to graduate from high school. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And, um, and so everything, in a way, everything about me is different from my family. I dress differently, I speak differently, I order different things when we go out for dinner, I drink different liquor, I mean, everything. But the one thing that I share with my family is this a deep abiding love of horror films and um, and this way in which if there's nothing if there's nothing else to do together or nothing else to talk about together we can go back to that and I I find um, so the draw for me with horror with first of all it was female sexuality and the idea that you could see um, I thought you could see gender theory in horror in a spectacular way a truly spectacular spectacular way that you couldn't see it necessarily in other texts and it was while I was preparing for my PhD exams that um, I happened to go to a colloquium the women's caucus of the graduate program that I was in had a program where we would invite women scholars to come in and talk about their work in progress and a friend of mine who was a medievalist was had invited a medieval scholar by the name of Carol J Clover to uh, come in and give a talk. And I wasn't gonna go because I figured she's gonna talk about Icelandic sagas. I've got an exam to study for, <laughs> why should I go? And my friend is saying, you have to go, you have to go. I'm afraid people won't come and this will be embarrassing. And yeah, and so boy, 
Am I Glad I Went? Because that was when she, she ha was getting ready to write the article for representations that became her body himself. And so the, instead of talking about the sagas, which is what I was expecting her to talk about, she started talking about slasher films. And I was just riveted. And she, she ended up being my dissertation director. So that's kind of a long, long, long story, but that was how I got pulled, pulled in. I really, um, I still think it's, um, if you want to talk about, if you want to talk about gender and sexuality and the body, and you don't want to look at slasher films and horror and body horror, I just don't see how you can do those things. It's like you can't do it without talking about pornography. You have to, mm. you have to be willing to actually look at the body. Mm. I think as well, what's really interesting connecting what um, how you've introduced yourself in Wickham is this notion of Dracula and the Gothic. I think actually um, Dracula and vampires have been mentioned a few times during this conference. And it's really interesting how now we kind of consider Dracula to be this text that's taught in schools and it's got that notion of kind of a cultural capital to it. And yet here we are at a slasher studies conference talking about slasher films in which I'm sure um, there's people within institutions who think, why horror? Oh, as yeah. Noel Horror once said, why horror? Why slasher? And yet it's interesting how, again, interests begin actually with these texts that actually are said to have more cultural value to them. Um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, because Vera also was talking about the fact, you know, she, our, our, scholarship works in sort of similar areas because I've also written on the downtown New York filmmakers. And it's interesting to me that when the downtown filmmakers of the 70s and 80s who, who were making films during the punk scene uh, were making their vampire films, those were slashers. I mean, those are people who have their throats ripped out by vampires. These are not like nice, neat little pinpricks and people swooning. These are people being attacked in the subway and really being left with these massive wounds. Mm. So, yes. It's interesting as well because that late 1970s Dracula cycle, I think, ended up coming out of um, the teen slasher cycle. Talking of vampires and the Gothic, um, I will hand over the mic um, to Murray Leader. Yes, well, that actually is a, is a good uh, segue because um, I would say that in, in my childhood, the first kind of horror that I became fascinated with was actually classical horror. I, I kind of replicated the trajectory of the genre from the beginning, if you like. And a lot of that was fueled by reading, by books that I took out from the library. For a long time, I worked at a library. I worked as a library page from about the age of 12. Uh, so I took out all kinds of books. And, and um, in a lot of the books I found about classical horror, if they talked about the slasher film, it was a bad object, you know, at the end of the book, then there'd be like, and everything went wrong when the slasher film came along, yeah. basically. And I think I internalized that discourse for a while and didn't really seek out the slasher film uh, until my teens. And a lot of them were available uh, on some cable channels that my parents subscribed to. So I taped them and, and you know, I, I'll admit that, you know, the, uh, uh, the presence of nudity was a big part of the appeal as well. Uh, that I, I watch them with the same level of interest that I, I uh, watch sex comedies and, and so on. And um, I, I, uh, there's a certain nostalgia linked to that, I think, uh, even though they were from the prior decade. But I, I like 80s slasher films because they seem so seedy and low budget and they seem so unapologetic about it. Yeah. Um, I can remember pretty specifically uh, when I first encountered Halloween. Uh, I, I'm not sure how old I was, but I might have been eight or nine and, and I was in my dad's hometown and some older children were outside of a out of the the one store in town, and there are some videos in the uh, in in the window, and they were like, "Oh, they have Halloween five. Uh, do they have Halloween three or something like that?" And it's like I didn't even know what this was. It's like okay, so so there's numerous films called Halloween, and what are they about exactly? Um, and I definitely latched on to Halloween very strongly. Uh, and uh, it was sort of uh, sort of an entry point in a way, but I think for all, for the longest time, I did kind of want to isolate it from the slasher film, which was entirely a taste formation. Uh, to go back to the stuff that that Joan was talking about, of course. Um, but in in undergrad, I did a, an English degree at the University of Calgary, 
And uh, I wrote a paper about Halloween in a uh, literary theory class of, on psychoanalysis. And I still remember uh, that the, the professor, um, it was my favorite class, but I think the worst English class, I, the worst mark I ever got in English class. Oh, no. And he, he, he said something to the effect of like, uh, you've made a, a persuasive case that this film lends itself well to psychoanalysis, but uh, this still isn't a very strong reading. Um, well, I, I showed him, I eventually <laughs> wrote, wrote the book on the topic. I'm sure he does not know this fact. Um, but as I went through my undergrad, I, I did a film minor and, uh, my, my, uh, mentor in undergrad Malik Khoury, who now teaches in, in Egypt, uh, was very encouraging of, of my wanting to write about horror films. And, uh, I read books like Clover's book and like Dika's book in, in the library. And I remember particularly uh, kind of reading both of their accounts of Halloween and thinking, oh, it's, it's so interesting that they interpret Laurie so differently. Uh, and and I, I kind of came around to thinking, it's like, well, that's because their different theoretical frameworks allow these readings. They're both correct within the frameworks uh, that they've set up. And uh, that's uh, an assignment that I, I've, I've assigned several times to students, sort of comparing and contrasting these two takes. Um, and then I wrote the book about Halloween for Devil's Advocates. And I, I don't know if John Atkinson is, uh, is listening right now, but my account of that is that I wanted to write, I said, suggested writing a book about the legend of Hell House or about another, another haunted house film, because that's what I was mostly studying. And um, he wanted something higher profile because it was earlier in the series. And eventually I came around to Halloween, think about this paper, I wrote about it long before. And so that's how that came about. And I was able to get, thanks to some friends who, who found some information somewhere, I was able to interview John Carpenter, which was uh, very nerve wracking, but very rewarding. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. since then, the slasher has reemerged in my writing whenever, whenever appropriate. Uh, I, I should stress that though I was a horror fan from early on, I was never like, I never would have called myself a slasher fan exactly. It was never something I gave particular weight uh, within being a horror fan, if anything, I was like more of a uh, a fan of uh, a fan of classical horror, as I'd say. Um, but I keep coming back to the slasher again and again in in different forms, and it's very teachable for one thing. It's very helpful in that regard. I think I've screened Halloween more than any other film in my classes. Uh, try to contain your surprise. It makes perfect sense though, because it's just such a perfect teaching object, right? Mm -hmm. um, so obviously we've been conferencing, um, I nearly said three weeks, we've been conferencing for three <laughs> days. I didn't think I would take it, let alone um, um, Yeah, we've been conferencing for three days. Um, and as we've, as you've uh, been telling us, you know, readings of Slasher are always these subjective accounts in academia um, using autoethnography. So whilst we set up the Slasher Studies um, summer camp, Wickham and I, we instantly thought to ourselves, you know, we'll call it Slasher Studies because like it's the study of slasher films. But um, all of a sudden we realized that actually Slasher Studies as a term, as a discipline, and I hate this word so much, disciplinary term, might actually be really important and really significant. I think the amount of times we read academic scholarship, look no further than The Final Girl, um, where Carol Clover's quite clearly talking about The Final Girl in relation to, um, I would, slasher films, but also, you know, exploitation films from the 70s um, and the 1980s. And yet everyone always takes the chapter on the final girl and they always then take it out of the slasher context and instantly apply it to um instantly apply it to any horror text um interesting that for example somebody in a possession narrative might still be called a final girl despite the fact there's a chapter on the possession narrative and sometimes we might even call final girls in rape revenge narratives when again we have a vocabulary for that in the other chapter um men women and chainsaws always seems to come down to her body himself um but this notion of code switching this notion of that distinction between horror studies and slasher studies seem so completely significant, but also so. Oh no, you're frozen. Yeah, you are. I'm so really helpful that I would okay. freeze then, right? Uh, <laughs> <You are. laughs> okay. 
So, um, sorry, let me just gather you, my... You were talking about code switching. Of course. Um, so in a, a lot of scholarship on Slasher that's especially been coming out in the past three years, I would say, um, people go out to say that their method is predicated on theory that explicitly relates to Slasher. And, and yet, even though they're adamant that they're talking about Slasher theory or what Wickham and I, I think, would call Slasher studies, they st you still end up seeing the killer as other derived from, you know, um, The American Nightmare by Robin Wood, which isn't explicitly about slasher films, even though there's um, a section on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. What do you, I'll actually read the question because I think it might be more coherent saying it, given that it's already written down. Um, so, um, yeah, what are your experiences working between horror and slasher and cult cinema? as a whole, I think the notion of court cinema is something really important to be considered here as well. Um, do you, have you as academics noticed this code switching when we, when academics and scholars are talking about these distinctions between slasher and horror? Um, and, there, and with this code switching, do you think um, that horror and slasher are two separate things or separate or do you think something in between um i'll start with wickham and wickham again i'll just go the same order as we well, did last that, okay there, there's a comment that's actually come up in in the chat that uh you know sort of thanks uh some uh thanks an ma advisor that was very um helpful and encouraging uh in in studying these sort of things and uh to that end i i this sounds like a divergence, but it's actually relevant. Uh, I, I, I'd love to thank my um, MA tutor and ultimately PhD supervisor, Stacey Abbott, um, who I, I knew I wanted to, to study horror sort of, you know, at some stage in my MA. And then later when looking at PhD ideas, uh, Friday the 13th came up. And if anybody knows Stacy and her work, and uh, yeah, it'd be difficult to to not. She's she's brilliant, and her works ju just amazing and everywhere. Um, but she does a lot of work on on vampires, and uh, and and uh, so many of these different interesting um, texts. And uh, her book, Celluloid Vampires, looks at the the you know bridges uh, between sort of urbanity and the vampire, and and. Uh, the way that this timeline sort of develops within uh, vampire film. Um, <clears throat> so that said, um, I, I was being tutored by somebody who uh, was very firmly within not just a horror background, but but something that's distinctly gothic. And the material she was throwing at me at the outset was um, very broadly horror. Uh, so, you know, things just like that, that fantastic overview by David Skull, the, uh, the monster show, uh, and, and, and stuff like that just sort of gave me, uh, horror is this nice broad context. But when I started going into the slasher, I found that the research material was strikingly specific. And I found the very thing that you found, uh, Daniel, especially with, um, uh, Clovers is that she is very clear about sort of separating out, you know, this, this is what the slasher has to say. This is what possession narratives are. This is, uh, you know, uh, rape revenge films. Um, Dika's entire book is, uh, you know, was, was very useful to me because it, it provided a useful sort of formal and, and um, animological guide for discussing the slasher. And uh, I'm also really pleased you brought up Wood because, of course, um, you know, his, his chapter on, on uh, the 70s, um, you know, does sort of broadly look at horror, but is it like kind of focuses in on things like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and, and uh, so forth. But it's interesting that his second chapter, uh, the, the one that sort of comes after that in uh, Hollywood from Vietnam to Reagan, is called Horror in the 80s but he's looking specifically at what he calls the teeny kill pick. Okay. So while there is some address of horror a bit more broadly for him, horror in the eighties and this, this expression of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, reactionary uh, Reaganite politics um, is, is condensed into, again, what he calls the teeny kill pick, what we've ultimately come to 
uh, sort of called the slasher, but there's so many other terms for it that are like kind of bleed those definitions. But I think within those bleeding definitions and terms, we start to see very distinct um, concerns that do arise around um, uh, around the slasher. Um, and and uh, the the idea of code switching, I remember, is something that that you know you and I came up with in in conversation, uh, and it it just sort of captures this experience that I have when I've done writing about horror a bit more broadly, and then when I go into slasher, I you know know that there are these tumblers that are clicking over in my head that I need to adjust my framework for thinking. Uh, so that I can appropriately articulate and engage with the body of work that exists on Slasher, um, which is, is partly the, the justification that uh, I think you and I had in, in, in having these conversations about coming up with this and, and what the, the ultimate aim of it is. So uh, here I am kind of being an apologist for the conference and uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to the other speakers to see you know, what they think. Steve, I'll pass the mic to you. Okay, I, I I don't know how helpful I'm going to be here for a number of reasons, and these uh, speak to my attitudes more generally towards the the genre and potentially the field itself. But I think one thing that, is, and I've already mentioned this, is that because of my youth, I, the horror and the slasher are indivisible for me. Like they're just it's just baked together in how I think about what horror is. So. I don't experience that same code switching because I've always thought of slasher as belonging to horror. And I suppose even though actually the slasher films draw on various genres, including comedy and sci-fi and sometimes even martial arts films. Um, the other thing is that I don't necessarily draw on horror studies as a distinct discipline either. So I tend to look for ideas outside of film studies. So I'm not that committed to genre studies per se anyway i suppose i've got an attitude that a subgenre's boundaries are also always loose and uh any genre itself is loose and ill-defined so and actually we've seen that in some of the chat um when during the various panels about you know does x count as a slasher film or not i those concerns don't have any meaning for me really because it's like well you define for yourself what this category is but you've got to do so on the proviso that we're talking about an imperfect heuristic with the implicit understanding that uh, the traits will be won't be replicated consistently across all films so i don't know i don't i don't feel like i'm i because i'm a bit of a sort of cannibal when it comes to the ideas anyway i don't really feel that kind of code switching it comes quite naturally to me that to <laughs> jolt between things but i understand what you mean about there's this type of film requires this type of apparatus, but then I suppose I have the ideas separate to the thing I'm applying it to, and then the the those constraints come naturally with the thing I'm applying it to. I think actually it's one of it. It, it is a really useful answer for many reasons. I think when we think about the study of slasher film or slasher studies, um, we always go to Barbara Creed, Carol Clover, Linda Williams. And what we're not acknowledging with that is that they're situated in feminist film theory, coming from a specifically revisionist feminist film theory of the 1980s, where it's no longer, you know, it's all about um, slasher as a fantasy genre. It's all about, you know, the man isn't necessarily con with the masculine gaze, just as a woman isn't necessarily confined to a feminine gaze. And, you know, um, you have Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel talking about the Women in Danger film, where we have slashes, but we also have rape revenge, we have exploitation. Um, and then obviously we have um, the Andrea Dworkin, Catherine McKinnon yeah. pornography backlash, um, where we're talking about slasher films as pornography, but again, it's being lumped with um, rape revenge films and exploitation films and the film snuff itself. Um, so I, th I think actually the, the very notion of slasher as a term is so recent. And really, if you think about it, you know, we have Richard Knoll now with Blood Money, which I think's really shifted the paradigm, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but that only came out in 2010, 2011. So now people often use terms like teen slasher, myself included, um, using teen slasher all the time. We're not actually situating it in not just the history of film studies, 
But in terms of the act, especially in terms of feminism and the feminist movement and anti-censorship debates, I think it's really important that slasher, we have to talk about horror and violent horror films to fully understand, especially again, this notion of code switching. I suppose my long tangent has hopefully said something interesting for um, Joan to pick up on <laughs> and well, uh, talk about code switching here. Yeah, well, um... Yeah, no, I, I think that this is one of the more difficult questions, actually, for me on your on your list for a whole variety of reasons, because I um like I said, you know, I came up in the 60s. And so I didn't start out with the slasher as um, as what I thought of as horror. And when I first saw Psycho, it scared the shit out of me. And and I remember that as being like clearly for me a, a game changer in what horror was or could be. But um, so I teach slashers within the context, usually of a genre class that is called horror. And, and there are ways for me in which the slasher is horror in that one of the things that draws me to horror is the way that it is a subversive genre. And, you know, I talked a little bit about this in my paper uh, yesterday, where I feel like there, you know, if there's going to be a critique made of the family, if there's going to be a critique made of patriarchy, if there's going to be a critique that's leveled against institutions that are sacred cows, and if, if they're dealt with in Hollywood drama, you always come to a closure where there's a you know, there's the re-instantiation of the normal, not the way that horror does it, but in this kind of completely saccharine, oh, dad's really a good guy kind of way. And if you want a serious critique, horror is the place where that happens, sort of across all the eras in which it occurs. The problem that I have with including slasher within horror is that... Um, you know, that problem we have with all of history, that myth of continual progress or continual evolution. And I've written about this a little bit in, in terms of writing about the Gothic, where if you follow the kind of classic histories of horror, you get this idea that, okay, so then there was, there was Bava and there was the heyday of, of Italian Gothic horror and Spanish Gothic horror, and then it went away. And we had zombie films and slasher films, but you know you could still look at Night of the Living Dead as a gothic film. You could certainly look at Psycho as a gothic film. There are gothic elements in those movies, and and for me that also becomes part of the problem with like well, so I'm I'm kind of getting tied up with my my words here, but the idea of of doing uh, having slasher just being part of a subgenre of horror means that you kind of continually have this okay. So first there was First there was this, first there was the gothic, then there was the zombie film, then there was the emergence of the psycho killer, then there was the slasher film, then we had torture porn, then we had the resurgence of the zombies. And it's always, it's the idea is always that there's this, some new hip trend that supplants and overturns the other. And I don't think that's the way horror works. I mean, I think we have all these things with us at all times just as you know one of the things that's come up in this in this conference is that it isn't that it was just michael freddie and jason that are the slashers that we have a whole bunch of new slashers who have come to the fore now and i'll stop there <laughs> and hand the baton over to murray because obviously i is this is one of those things that just drives me crazy um I find it with my students, that my students come into my horror class and they draw the line between what they consider to be like real horror, which is the violent stuff, sometimes for the good or for the bad, and what they don't consider to be real horror, which is more the gothic stuff. And so I have people who come up to me and say, you know, I don't really like horror, but I'm in this club. <laughs> Why are you in this class? <laughs> you don't really like horror. They said, well, they said that you taught other things too. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> I think that's a problem that a lot of people have teaching an undergraduate horror course with students who don't like horror. I Very know. <laughs> um, Murray, I'll mm. pass the mic over to you now. Yeah, a lot's been said. A lot of interesting things have been said. Um, I, I guess I, I, um, I, I also don't really know how to answer this question. I'd say that while writing my horror intro textbook, I was conscious of giving uh, the slasher film a share of the floor, but not giving it too much because there were a lot of things to uh, 
uh, to juggle, and I was wanting to represent the diversity of the horror genre the best I could. If I had a secret agenda in that book, it was to talk about ghosts and ghost films and haunted house mm -hmm. films more than tends to get, to, because that that's a type of film that is subject to a lot of code switching and doesn't tend to get talked about that much within horror films with certain select exceptions. Um, but, you know, I, I tend to think of, uh, to borrow from Bridget Cherry a bit, uh, horror as a kind of cl set, uh, a, a, uh, a cluster of a set of subgenres, a set of national cycles, a set of uh, films designed for different audiences, etc. Um, all of which uh, have a kind of resemblance to each other, a kind of family resemblance, but some of which function fairly differently than others. So it seems to me that it's reasonable to treat the slasher as a uh, as its own entity with its own uh, with its own qualities, um, at least provisionally, but also uh, acknowledge that it exists under the umbrella of the concept of horror most of the time, uh, with this whole bunch of set of provisos because it attaches to other genres too, including the action film. Increasingly, I think. Um, so that's kind of what I want to say about that. I think I, I remember kind of going what back to Joan was was saying towards her introduction, where she's talking about Jalo and the Gothic, and you know, in a lot of um, scholarship, Jalo and slasher are always treated yeah. very differently, and slasher is a subgenre, and uh, Jalo is described as a felony, um, which is an Italian. Have I frozen again? No, you're okay. Oh, I, everybody went so still, and I was like, "I'm okay." <laughs> <laughs> it was so cool. We uh, couldn't hang on every word. <laughs> it but was no, a prank. Like, we planned it. So I know. I know. <laughs> um, but no, in um, sl um, in slashership, <laughs> in scholarship on the Italian giallo, it's referred to as felony, which is kind of the recognition of some. It's the recognition of form to kind of use a word that Wickham really likes. It's all about recognizing a form and a style and these characteristics, but they are so, you know, you can recognize them, but, you know, it, I suppose a Filoni is pretty much the same as the Gothic, right? You know the Gothic when you see it. Yeah. Um, and the fact that, you know, even if we go back to the very first paper of the conference where Catherine Lester was talking about um, the terrible place in the family, um, you know, Coraline is a slasher film, gothic, there's such yeah. um, synergy there. I mean, the next, I'm gonna, <laughs> the next question you didn't answer, it, it's, it, it's interesting because the narrative that Wickham and I wanted to build with this round table discussion, we had an idea in our heads of how it would turn out. Based upon your responses, <laughs> you couldn't have given me better responses because you've already kind of created the perfect groundwork here. So the, the next question was going to be about, you know, we have this established idea of what horror studies is. And horror studies is its own discipline in its own right. And if we do create something along the lines of slasher studies, it's separate from that. Talking of the Gothic, we all of us, especially the Gothic, we suddenly realize that horror studies is in itself an appropriation of so many different other, um, so many different other um, schools of thought, disciplines, etc., in which we refer to it as um, we refer to it as a discipline. Um, but again, it's. I'm sorry, I lost my um, train of thought, which is really useful when you're chairing a panel. <laughs> um, but it's all about this notion of appropriation. I'm so sorry. Um, oh, this is so embarrassing, isn't it? Anyway, the notion of appropriation, the fact that horror studies is appropriated and doesn't necessarily exist um, because we're coming from different places. Henceforth, I think we're always contending with Carol Clover and Linda Williams, Barbara Creed, etc. I think the reason as to why we're still contending to this day is because they're talking about, they're talking about different things, but using a theme. And when we study slasher films, 
we're looking at them through that theme, but the theme isn't actually, shall I say, the meat and potatoes <laughs> of what they're actually talking about. They're actually talking about completely different things, um, no matter where you turn. Um, so I think Joan will like exactly where this question is going now in term, and in fact, um, Murray as well, talking about this notion of cultural distinctions. The way that Slash has been theorized is really interesting because we have um, the theory that's based upon, you know, cine psychoanalysis and fantasy, and it's very kind of deep. It's about subjectivity, the subconscious, gender, etc. There's other scholarship that's looking at it kind of from an industrial perspective, and it's like, you know, slasher films are cheap and easy to make, and therefore people make them because it's cheap, and it's a great way to kind of get into the filmmaking business. I think Vera Dika's keynote yesterday perfectly articulated that. Um, but there never seems to be any talk about the overlap, overlap between prestige and this notion of slashes as cheap and easy to make. So what I would like to ask each of you with this is, do you think that we need to be talking about overlaps between um, slasher as something that, you know, in terms of cultural prestige, we can use it to think about psychoanalysis, for example? Um, but do you think, some, obviously, simultaneously, we can talk about it in terms of industry, cheap filmmaking, etc., exploitation aesthetics? But how would you articulate the separation and, indeed, how they would overlap? Wickham, I'll start with you again. I, I This is, I, I think I've sort of helped you draft this question, and it's one that's sort of, like, not really stumping me, but it is uh, something that I find deeply interesting here. Um, I, the fact that there are so many emerging concerns, because of course, you know, you go back to, uh, again, sort of, uh, Wood's work on, on, um, you know, sort of, uh, the, the larger sociopolitical, uh, structures, uh, Clover, you know, uh, Dika, Williams, um, and, and, uh, Creed, uh, you know, looking at gender, uh, and, and, uh, as you said, you know, um, these themes being the meat and potatoes and, and um, this, this um, you know, the industrial material that's, you know, emerged with, uh, you know, like Richard Knoll, uh, as, as you mentioned. Um, and and I, I think this is sort of all leading me to thinking about um, how slasher, I think there are crossovers. I think there are ways that, you know, it, it does sort of bleed into the, um, like perhaps surrounding distinctions. Somebody in the comment was talking about Venn diagrams, particularly around like the giallo. Um, but but um, I, I think there are ones where it crosses over into other areas of concern. Um, but I also think it's it's perhaps slightly unfair to completely put it under an umbrella. Um, you know, of of something like uh, horror more broadly. Um, and and I, I to to Joan's point about this this kind of his like this idea that there's a an, a firm historical timeline for how horror grows and develops um, is is um, certainly a fallacious notion to be uh, uh, engaging with um, rather it's something that's drawing on all of this stuff but we can also ring fence it and like learn a lot both about um both about these themes you know what what these are doing as popular horror specifically um you know the the fact that they were so popular certainly for like a, a four year period uh and and then uh keep having you know resurgences to the point where i would argue it hasn't completely died it's just mutated uh if, if you're you know going to your genre theory like uh you know um rick altman and steve neal um there you know it's a historical process so what we understand is the slasher now looks very different from what it used to but that's the nature of genre um if we ring fence it and and look at it we can learn a lot about these themes, about the industry, uh, and about storytelling, because for me, it is cheap and easy. It's efficient storytelling. It is, um, you know, sort of the 
quickest, simplest, uh, and easiest way to tell a story that you can then capitalize upon. You know, that's of course that's part of the industrial context there. Um, but also, I, I, I think in in terms of this sort of linear uh, historical developments, uh, the slasher doesn't necessarily like. Like, I think it clearly. Um, helps break that idea apart. And I, I tend to see is, th this is gonna sound slightly disgusting, but the slasher is a growth on the body of horror that we, <laughs> that, that we can just, you know, that, that we the doctor needs to examine. Mm -hmm. we, we've got to look at this uh, and, and see what it's doing to the, to the rest of everything. Um, it and it's terrible it's, Wickham because yeah. the taste police would say it's a cancer that has to be. Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was choosing my words very <laughs> carefully. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I think there's something about being able to identify a segment of something that has connections to other things that has its own observations in its own right. Steve, I'll pass the mic over to you. I, I'm going to confess at the start that I've completely lost the thread of this I question because I'm so sleep deprived. <laughs> but um, I will try. I will endeavour to answer anyway. Um, my, I suppose, again, I think this is going to be biased from where I come from. That I, can, I don't really think of horror studies as being necessarily just about horror studies. I'm, I'm quite a conceptual thinker, so I tend to think of horror films as being films that have moments of horror in them. So that. Anything that has moments of disgust or trepidation or something that's aiming towards the audience and aiming to guide them in that way, that's horror for me. So I don't see a separation between slasher and horror in that respect. Um, and I suppose that um, I've lost a train of thought where I was going with that now as well. Sorry. Um, no, I've completely lost myself. Sorry. Do you want us to come back to oh. you? Prestige, that's what I was going to say about it. So I, I suppose the other thing is that the way that I think about um, approaching anything is that just because something doesn't have prestige, it doesn't mean it doesn't have significant meaning. And sometimes it can be just the case that all I'm trying to do is articulate something that I can see in a text that I don't, whether it was intended or not, doesn't really matter. It's just that I don't think the text is... Uh, or the people watching the text might necessarily articulate it in the same way I would, but I think it's there and it just needs to be brought out and demonstrated. So I, I, I think I'm quite used to taking high theory to, and applying it to something like pornography or whatever I'm looking at, even though that's considered trash, to say, well, actually, it doesn't really matter that this is trash because it's still got things to say because it's made by humans and all humans have things to say. So I suppose that's my attitudes are biasing where I'm coming from is where I'm, what I'm getting at. I'll pass the mic over to Joan, but I think also with Joan, I think it would be interesting to hear maybe the answer in relation to Cutting Edge and what you were kind mm. of doing with the book, because I feel like Cutting Edge is actually a really fantastic way um, and provides a really fantastic framework within which to actually approach this question. Because uh, um, well, what, what I was trying to do in that book, what I kind of explained even more later is I see a dialectical relationship between high and low culture. Um, and I mean that really in the old Eisensteinian sense that there's high, high art and there's low culture and they just smash into each other. It's not just that there's a Venn diagram where there are areas of overlap, there are kind of new cultural forms that emerge as a result of high and low culture kind of banging into each other and it happens over and over and over and over again and um and i think that when you know with some of my favorite filmmakers i think that you know such that it becomes very hard when you look at some of the films set where you could actually say okay where does the pornography end and the art film begin or where does the where does the the low crass body horror stuff end and the more philosophical approach to horror begin i find these things you know for me this is a very difficult question and i wrote in part i wrote that book um out of anger i had gone to a conference that was the celebration of the hundred years of cinema and um this will actually kind of bring us back to another aspect of your question. I had gone to a, a conference that was supposed to be a celebration of the 100 years of cinema. I was sitting with 
uh, some friends of mine, and I watched person after person after person after person get up at this conference and talk about degraded cultural products. And that was the term that was being used at this conference, degraded cultural products. And that these were, she wanted to make clear that, you know, like certain... Uh, it was not just this one woman, but a whole range of speakers were saying, you know, like, these are European art films. These are not degraded cultural products. And by the time I got up to give my paper, I was just, I mean, I, had, I could just rip it up and toss it up in the air because I was fuming. And I said, you people do not know where European art films were shown in the 1950s. And where they were shown in the 1950s when we had the Hayes Code, they were shown in bump and grind houses down on Times Square. That's where they were shown. And you would see Godard one week and you would see, you know, JD bikers go to hell the next week. And that is where these films play. So don't talk to me about your degraded cultural products. And that's sort of how, how, how Cutting Edge was born. Um, but one of, so, so kind of moving out from that, I had a couple things I wanted to say. Number one is that one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot because I'm starting to think about this book on indie horror is that, you know, when we talk about the slashers, like we take these films that ori originally were like these films that were cheap and fast and easy to make. And now because we have given, there has been this kind of uh, academic um, discourse that has grown up around them, they have become, in this weird way, they've become canonized. So, and they've been given, you know, 3K and 4K treatments, they've been remastered, they've been made to look beautiful. Um, so films that initially were kind of pretty raw looking have been, the trash aesthetics have been kind of, um, have been, uh, you know, kind of taken out of them because we've, we've improved them so much or we've, whatever, I've lost the word. Um, we've remastered them. We've remastered them into looking good, um, which they didn't do at the beginning. And one of the things that's been bothering me for a while, actually, in horror studies is the way in which we kind of continually keep going back to films that are getting mainstream distribution. And we haven't really been talking about, there is this whole kind of group of films that are, they only play at festivals, if at all, or they go direct to video. When they're at festivals, people are selling them out of the, you know, backs of their car on little CDs that they've done, or they give you, like, the link with the passcode that you can get. And these are very raw, very brutal films. I mean, truly. And there are films like, there's, like, one film's called Headless, which is about, there's a person who doesn't have a head, and many appalling things are done in and with that hit. And there was a sequel called Found, which was the same kind of principle where this young man finds that his brother is a serial killer. And these are, these were, these are films that are very popular on a certain kind of Z market that we aren't talking about in academic circles. And I, I, so that's point one is I guess I think we should. And, um, partly because I'm so indebted to uh, being angry over taste, rigid taste distinctions. The, the other thing I wanted to say though that I, occurred to me when we were talking is like, you know, we have a horror studies SIG in Society for Cinema and Media Studies. There's a scholarly interest group called Horror Studies. There's a, we call it adult film history in Society for Cinema and Media Studies, which is our porn studies SIG. But as opposed to like the Gothic studies has the Gothic studies association and they have their own conference. It's an international conference and it covers all aspects of the Gothic. It's literature, it's art, you know, kind of um, graphic art, it's film, it's everything. And, and everybody feels very deeply um, kind of bound together through certain understandings of the Gothic in whichever genre or medium they work, but the idea is that there is some sort of overarching notion of the Gothic. It occurs to me, we don't really have that. We don't have a horror studies association that meets. I mean, I was very excited that there was gonna be a slasher studies conference because it's the one time that we kind of got our own, like we got our own thing, you know, cause we don't usually get our own thing. And so, so there's that understanding as well. Like if we're talking about um, horror studies, Horror studies is still like a bastard child of cinema studies writ large, so that we're just 
a, a genre. I guess like film noir too, because they don't really have their own, they don't have their own association of their own conscience either. Um, then the, and the last thing I wanted to talk about was a little bit with psychoanalysis, which is on the one hand, I think we have to pay a lot of attention to exhibition and distribution because there are a lot of, there just are a lot of titles and a lot of artifacts that we aren't even bringing um, our critical lens to bear on because they don't make it to they don't make it to mainstream distribution. Um, psychoanalysis it's one of those weird things I mean there's for all the flaws of psychoanalysis and all the flaws of, of heavy duty psychoanalytic theory I still believe in it <laughs> and the reason I believe in it is because if if everything happened on the conscious level or the economic or industrial level we we would be living in Valhalla by now we would have gotten rid of sexism, we would have gotten rid of racism, we would have gotten rid of all of these isms that aren't even economically helpful to us. And we can't seem to friggin' let them go. And that to me suggests that there's a lot that's going on that we just simply can't get at. I live in a country that is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We have a surplus of vaccines and we have a, a, a group of people like over 40% of the population say they will not get a vaccine. And it doesn't matter what any what anybody says is not going to convince them logically to go get a vaccine. And something is hap something else is going on there that has nothing to do with Dr. Fauci finding the right way of explaining yet again how a friggin' virus works. So I'm sorry. I, I went all over the map. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> I want. I like. I, I'm happy that someone has defended psychoanalysis because I so truly and deeply feel that. I feel like, in itself, the notion of subjectivity and, ironically, the notion of you know repetition compulsion. Yes. <laughs> I think oh. repetition <laughs> compulsion is so relevant to yes. pretty much everything that we do, especially as academics yes. in this particular field. We are defined by repetition compulsion. And I will tell you, anybody who hasn't yet had a child, when you have a child, you you find how repetition compulsion where that child finds a movie that they like or a book that they like, you will see that movie 15 times a day for you know three months and you better like that movie too because it's <laughs> oh yes so murray i'll pass the microphone over to you and as a audio cue i will tell you cultural distinctions and slasher in case you yeah. forgot <laughs> yeah. I, I, i'm not each time i have to go after joe and i feel like i'm uh, go, uh, having to play after james brown finishes or <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Um, but uh, and so I'll keep this, this brief. I have a couple of recovered memories that may not be entirely accurate, but I think bring to bear on this a little bit. Um, one was that in the, f the first time the American Film Institute did one of those long congratulatory hundred years, uh, hundred movies things. Yeah, yeah. I remember that there's a, a bit towards the end when they're just about to announce Citizen Kane or maybe a little before when they, they have a montage of like celebrities rattling off films, you know, that they like, but which aren't on the list, uh, something like that. And I'm sure, I'm sure this is somewhere to check. My recollection is they briefly show Samuel L. Jackson saying, I still like slasher films. <laughs> and it's like two seconds and then they move on. Yes. And I, I was thinking, of course there are no slasher films on the list unless you count Psycho, which clearly isn't being yeah. framed as a slasher film within this project, right? Um, and, uh, I remember thinking that interesting because it's it's like clearly this is like a impish moment, right? Yeah. Acknowledging tastes which run counter to the project of the film industry celebrating its own middle brow greatness, basically. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So why this little moment of uh, uh, this little moment of transgression in there, and why is the uh, the slasher film, the object of that transgression. But I was thinking that this this was in the late 90s. Uh, so by that point, I think, yeah, this canonization or at least recuperation of the slasher film had proceeded to the extent that at least the slasher film could be named. Um, I, I feel like if he had said, I still like porn films, they just wouldn't have included that, right? <laughs> um, and there's lots of reasons for that uh, that that process. And I, you know, I, I I just I don't think that slasher films are all that far down the respectability list anymore. P part of it is just time, like that quote in Chinatown about how everything becomes respectable if it's if it lasts long enough. 
academic credibility is certainly part of that. And um, also the idea that that like other less respectable things, notably torture porn, come along and just inevitably bump it up the cultural register as a consequence of there being something lower. I don't know, Steve, if you would disagree with that assessment. Um, and <laughs> that sounds the, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the other thing, um, one time I was outside of a mall in Calgary and a, a guy, uh, these two kids with, with video cameras were like, hey, you wanna be in our movie? And I was like, sure. And uh, <laughs> so they gave me a fake cell phone and then a guy in a screen mask runs over and steals it from me. And I, so <laughs> somewhere I'm for I'm in some teenager's movie. But I that's a, a, a thing that I think could be investigated, like the slasher film in amateur filmmaking. Because I think it probably appeals to amateur filmmakers for the same reason it appeals to independent filmmakers, that it can be done on a shoestring in everyday locations, etc. And nobody has to be pretty. Uh, <laughs> So I, I, I don't know, uh, maybe I should talk to Charles Tepperman, my, my former colleague from the University of Calgary has done all this great work on amateur cinema, but I know there is a body to be found of amateur horror films and probably a lot of them are slasher films. So I'll I toss it a, back to you, Daniel. Thanks. I had a similar experience as you had actually. Really? I was, yes, I was standing, I was coming out of a bar one night and some people who were making a film asked if I would just stand over by this alley and be in their movie. And I, I ended up being one of the introductory ladies of the night in this <laughs> horror film as this guy is dragging another victim down the alley. <laughs> wow, amazing. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I want to say very briefly, uh, Joan, I, I would really love for everyone to normalize the idea of rage publishing. Uh, I think that's something <laughs> yeah. we all need to, uh, uh, to engage in more. Yeah. Um, one thing I am conscious of is time. I'm just wondering, are you happy for us to extend this session by 10 minutes so we can finish at half past? Okay. Um, so I suppose from the conversation that we've been having, um, the, the, the critical thing really seems to be the fact that we don't actually like the word slasher. And actually slasher in itself, you know, is it horror? Is it gothic? Is it jalo? What is it? Um, so I suppose this, um, <sighs> interpret, <laughs> interpret this next question how you like, um, because I think you will all interpret it in actually really interesting ways. Um, so the question itself is in historical and contemporary terms, what do you see as the defining theoretical and thematic concerns of current um, research and writing on slasher? Um, and what do you think are the most urgent and pressing issues moving forward? I, I I know that I had created like a formulaic kind of let's pass the baton along, but I think um, with Joan mentioning psychoanalysis, I feel like it could actually be a really interesting kind of point of beginning and then to move. I mean, we're talking about moving the, moving the discussion forward and what, is the pressing matter of research now. Um, and I think it would be interesting to hear about psychoanalysis itself predicated on what you've just said previously in kind of defense of it as a methodology. Did you want me to start? Yeah, if that's okay. Yeah, so um, I th I, again, I think as, just as there's this problem with looking at the history of horror as as one of kind of constant overturn and and kind of again like this myth of eternal progress, I feel like this idea that somehow we can uh, we've moved past psychoanalysis and we've moved past Marxism needs to be reevaluated. So I think both of those isms could be um, could be could be productively applied to contemporary slashers. So that's one thing, because I think that we're still dealing, we're still dealing with a cultural unconscious in many ways, and we're dealing with a cultural unconscious. I mean, this goes back to sort of Robin Wood's land and, and screen theory, this moment when there was this recognition that there's, there's sex and there's money. And really, there's not much else you can say about culture until you kind of deal with those things. As long as there are these inequalities, we're always going to be dealing with sex and money with race being a sort of subset of both of those things. We're freaked out. Why are we freaked out about race? Because of sex, who controls our women? And because of money, you know, who 
we we need we need slavery in order to uh, create the con the country again the country that I was raised in. Um, so so for me that's one aspect and the other thing is just to go back to what I said before is I really think there's a lot of product out there that we're not looking at through a critical lens that we do need to. I mean, we need those kids who are making these movies on their cell phones and, and hauling, <laughs> hauling people like Murray and me aside and saying, you look like, you look like somebody who could be in my horror movie. <laughs> you just stand, stand here for a minute. Um, that we need to take a look at their films because um, often they're very interesting. Often they are, um, I'll, I'll go back to actually, so this is, a, this is again another loop, but I remember I was asked to be on a panel. This was part of the Diabolique Film Festival. So it was one of these film festivals that's showing like grade Z um, horror films. And there was gonna be a panel on women in horror. Now I had just taught a horror class and I had had students who were interested in women directors of horror and they had been researching through all the kind of normal channels and they were finding, you know, like just a couple of people essentially. Um, and, and so I'm on this panel with, you know, three women directors, two women stars, and then there was me essentially. And we had gone out for brunch. It was a lively panel because we'd gone out for brunch ahead of time. And when the waiter realized that we were all going to be on this horror, horror panel, he was making very strong mimosas. So we were kind of half lit by the time we actually got to this panel. But one of the things that really struck me was that there was like, even in terms of like who makes the films and gender imbalances that we talk about as though they were just given in Hollywood cinema mainstream, um, filmmaking. In the indie market, that's not the case. Anybody who can operate a camera is given a camera to operate. And people who have ideas and have scripts can usually make their money because you can shoot on a cell phone now. And so it's not only that there are titles that we aren't seeing, there are whole kind of um, there are whole kinds of trends in the production that we aren't seeing because we're not paying enough attention to the to the really cheap, 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 like like three thousand dollars for a, for an entire budget movie. Mm. Um, kinds of films. I'd really like to, I'll give Murray a break so he doesn't have to speak directly <laughs> after James. After, Jones, um, after James Brown. Mama's got this, a brand new <laughs> This literally so perfectly ties in with Steve's keynote from Friday. So I'm going to bring Steve in now because I think he's going to have a lot to say, especially about distribution and independent filmmaking. Yeah, thank you. I was going to ask whether I could come in because uh, I would like to echo what Joan's been saying of um, about one of the things, one of the drivers are behind the kinds of films that I'm looking at, especially in the book, but across everything I've written really, is precisely to look at the what's going on on the fringes, because that tends to be where the most interesting things are happening. At the moment, I think we're in a, a point with, with this particular subgenre where the field is quite fragmented. There are a lot of different things going on, but the most interesting things are happening on the micro budget end, precisely because they've got more creative freedom, because they've got less at stake. And actually, I think that's one of the things that Lloyd Kaufman was getting at the other day as well, is that we need to draw attention to what's happening on the peripheries so the peripheries can survive. Otherwise, we'll just have shitty Marvel movies and nothing else. Um, but I, I genuinely believe that there's there's so much... You often have to wade through a lot of badly made films to get to the gems yeah. but there when you get to the gems you find the real gems and you won't find them in the center because no one's funding them in the center because you have to make pap in the center because everyone's afraid of losing their money um so if you want to find out what's going on or what the next stages of the slasher film are going to be or any genre are going to be you have to look at the outliers and actually on the same subject one of my recent rage publications was in a volume called um, the new blood um where i'm talking precisely about this and how the, the one of the problems with academic writing at the moment is that we tend to perpetuate that focus on the center and that focus on the center often comes from the critical press who are identifying films that they want to disparage. So and we're just following those trends. And so I use like a Serbian film as, or a Human Centipede as examples of this is that I think they've garnered so much attention precisely because the critical press said these films are awful and then we've leapt to their defense. Whereas actually we should be using some of that energy to look at all the other films that no one's talking about instead. Cause I think that's the way we're going to advance not only the prospects of those filmmakers, but also our own academic discourses. Murray, what is um, what are your thoughts on this one? Oh boy, 
<laughs> I, I, uh, uh, what are my thoughts? That's, uh, uh, what was the question again? I'm sorry. I'm sorry to pull what, that one. What, what would you say are the most pressing issues right now in terms of studying and oh, researching yeah. slasher? Yeah. Um, well, I, 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 uh, I would echo what's been said, but I, I do think that the, the focus on cultural taste, which we've sort of gravitated to here, is something that could warrant a lot more discussion than has happened thus far. Uh, and this, the slasher is a very reflexive kind of genre. Like the slasher always seems on some level to be thinking about itself, even when it's doing it sincerely uh, rather than parodically. Um, so it's, it's, it's because it's such a saturated genre. I, I think that uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's funny. I, I was having trouble sort of gathering my thoughts on this question because it's, it, all the things that came to my mind about, you know, uh, we could talk about the slasher more in terms of, uh, in terms of race, in terms of class, in, term, in terms of queerness, those things all seem to be happening. Um, and um, I, I, uh, I, I, I was sort of thinking like, well, okay, what shouldn't we talk about? Uh, or what, uh, what has been sufficiently litigated at this point? And there, there's part of me in the back of my mind that wonders, you know, is there a space for a provocation that's like, okay, let's not talk about the final girl anymore. Is it, is it time to just consign that topic to cultural, uh, to cultural history uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't reside in academia anymore? Now, I'm not actually saying that one should do that, but there, uh, it, it is a, a, um, a concept that's been litigated and relitigated to a point where, um, you know, uh, there seems uh, like a kind of a kind of sense of like oversaturation of that particular discussion. Um, and I, I'm so far away from the original question. That's not even funny at this point. <laughs> it's still totally relevant, to be quite honest. Um, Wickham. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, actually, that that um, that's a really interesting point that I think um, speaks to what we were actually kind of trying to do here. Um, you know, I, I, the, the question of whether or not we should sort of resign the final girl to the uh, to the history of academia rather than the contemporary <laughs> um, discourse um, is is you know, so, something that I feel like, you know, we should at least think about before we say yes or no. Um, and, and, but I feel like a lot of us, when we're talking about slashers, uh, sl slasher specifically, um, we keep going back to that well, because I think we often feel like we're writing in isolation. Uh, and the reason we wanted to do this conference is because we wanted to give everybody a chance who wants to write about this stuff to come together uh, and talk about it. Uh, and and see where everyone else's thoughts are. So I, I think personally, my idea is that you know we we probably shouldn't throw that on the 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 scrap heap of academic history. Um, you know, and and we shouldn't likely do away with say Dika or Wood or you know anybody because you know heaven knows people were talking about Freud long enough. Uh, and, and still are in some ways. Um, but there's got to be this point where we start pushing the discourse forward because it's speaking to contemporary ideas and concepts and, and topics um, and, and the, the state of play as it stands, you know, that our, our world around us is, um, you know, is like Joan was talking about and, and you know, I, my, <laughs> I'm from America. I, you know, I, I, so my heart is still there to a certain extent, even though I've been here for over a decade. Um, you know, the, the state of play, the socio-political and economic conditions there um, certainly have its roots in the 1980, which is kind of why those films are sort of relevant. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, our concerns have, have, you know, progress to a point, you know, to a terrifying uh, extent in some ways because of what was happening back then. So I think our discourse needs to catch up to that. Um, so 
you know, while when I first started my PhD, I was interested in style and form. And I was just like, I'm sick of all of these people writing about psychoanalysis and gender. I just want to do form. Why isn't anybody talking about that? So I just made my own little sandbox and started playing around with style and form with the slasher film. Uh, and I had a good time with it. And then like once I start taking steps out, I see where all of these things start to tie in and where the other discourses that are happening begin to um need contemporizing and i think we can only really do that when we have gatherings like this where we can have these conversations um because as as much as you know we can wait for the next publication about it and start to build off of that um being in an in an immediate space be it one that's virtual like this in fact this virtual space is so much more helpful because we've been able to make it free and we've been able sorry mm -hmm. it sounds like a promotion for the conference and i don't mean it to be but we're able to make it free and we're able to get people from all over the world to come in and talk um and this is where we start to grow and develop those ideas and i i think that's the urgent necessity um in terms of, of where this academic discourse is going. It's not about throwing anything to history necessarily, but it's about seeing how those past ideas can be perhaps made relevant to now and taking those um, identified relevancies and uh, progressing them as well for the future. I, and the other good thing about it being virtual is you've been able to archive everything. Mm, so, complete. so we'll, you know, it'll be accessible to us, which is wonderful. Um, I will throw out the last question in a second, but one thing that I really, w I was going to write a paper on this for the conference, and I decided not to because I don't have any time because I'm writing a PhD, or at least I should be. Um, but what is, you know, Murray mentioned the final girl, and what we and and Joan mentioned psychoanalysis, and that we still yeah. need to use it the way that we get out of the final girl is by using psychoanalysis and going back to those very debates. We need to recognize the relevance of the Oedipus complex. Carol Clover is not saying that the most important identification in the slasher film is the shift from the killer to the final girl. She's specifically drawing on this notion of the middle this notion of the end is the end of the Oedipus complex. Actually, what's important about these films is the middle. She's specifically engaging. You know, she didn't even theorize. She wasn't the first to theorize um, slasher as sadomasochistic. It was Steve Neal in 1980, 1981 with his article on Halloween. And even in that, he was using Kaja Silverman and her... Um, article and masochism and subjectivity yeah, masochism. Yeah. and what and what clover's really talking about is the fact that men aren't having these sadistic identifications and the most important part isn't being fallacized it's about being able to have this shifting identification it isn't sadistic it's not masochistic it's somewhere in the middle, it's a slasher film, it's splatter, it's messy. And yet we're so adamant that we're beyond psychoanalysis that we're totally missing that point. And it's so important because we theorize the killer and the final girl as dual. And we're writing the victims as literal victims to discourse. They're not slasher victims just in the film they're victimized by us as critics, mm. right? And we're not talking about them and they need to be theorized because they are as frequently consistent as the killer and the final girl. And what we also have to recognize here is the fact that how many people watch a slasher film, identify with that victim who dies. Who doesn't want to identify with, with Sarah Michelle Geller in... Um, I know what you did last summer. They have that real extended chase scene that was kind of derived from um, Prom Night 1980. Um, and we really feel for her. And yet people still write about Jennifer Love Hewitt, who's probably one of the least interesting characters in that film, you know? And I think it's just on my own personal note here, I know it's not necessarily my round table discussion to, to mention this, but I think it's so important in terms of, 
pretty much like Wickham was saying in terms of history, recognizing the methods and methodologies that people are using at that particular time and actually paying attention to those and understanding fully what people mean. Because I think often we see we see the name and the basic definition, but we don't look at the true roots. We don't look at the method. We don't understand the true meaning. I mean, with this, I think the next question, I mean, we've got about five, four minutes left. So the last question, and I'm kind of gonna make it a, whoever wants to answer, answer, is this very notion of slasher studies. Of, um, in relation to the notion of horror studies, is does slasher studies deserve to be its own academic discipline? Obviously, I... Oh, you froze. Oh, dear. <laughs> you froze well, in a marvelous you... way. <laughs> um, but do you understand? But I, I, I don't know. What do you think are kind of the paradoxes or the positives of theorizing something like slasher studies as a distinct discipline? I'll let the first person to talk I can go for it. <laughs> I'm going to be rude and do it then, because yeah. I'm not going to okay, say this intersection. So I think that the um, one of the potential risks of that is um, that, as Joan already said, that horror studies is still the bastard child of film studies, which is the bastard child of literary studies, which is the bastard child of you know something else. So uh, I think that there's there's a number of risks with posing it as its own discipline one is that it wouldn't be taken seriously another is that i think we need to turn the tide of thinking that the slasher is dated and just belongs to the 80s for instance because there's outside of academia certainly that's the impression i get and the other thing is that i think there is still a persistent um understanding of the slasher outside of academia that is still associated with misogyny because that's the level at which the discourse mm -hmm. operates so those those are the risks as i see it I'll let Joan or Murray take the lead on this one because I think Wickham and I will inevitably write something somewhere about this. Yeah, I, I, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say that the one thing that strikes me is that I've always had this vague feeling that in writing on the, on the slasher film, I know this is odd coming from me, Halloween gets too much play, uh, that it's turned to as a kind of legitimizing text too often and the ways in which it's not representative or not fully representative tend to get overlooked. And I feel like slasher studies might, you know, inevitably fall into that same sort of trap uh, of, you know, uh, creating its own canon uh, as a kind of legitimating force. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know it's weird for me to say that. I, and I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question because I still want to go back to the final girl until we throw her under the bus. I, from a psychoanalytic point of view, again, it's not just um, that we need to bring psychoanalysis back into talking about films, or at least not put it aside as much as I think we've been wanting to do. But we, we need to take a good, hard psychoanalytic look at what we've done as critics, because Carol Clover's argument is very, very, very complicated. And what we have gotten rid of in talking about the final girl, in reducing her to this stereotype that now seems to be kind of have maybe outworn her her run is we've got the strong woman who has become a, a phallic woman who's standing alone at the end of the film and that's what we're invested in we're not invested in or have have conveniently turned our attention away from the ideas about male masochism as a viewing strategy not male sadism and we have we have been very uncomfortable with and we keep refusing to deal with the fact that what Clover argued was not that the woman was a woman, that it was a w female body onto which male anxieties about castration could be projected because of a continuing uh, relevance in the present of old primordial primal beliefs in a one sex body. It's a very complicated introduction that she writes up, that she writes up. And, um, you know, it, it, this reminds me a lot. So when we talk about The Final Girl, I'm reminded a lot about the conversations I have with my students about the TV show, The X-Files, where the students will talk about the fact that Scully is this, you know, that this is a feminist text because Scully is the scientist. She's the rational one. She's the one who is doing the forensic work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's Mulder who's the one who is going off the deep end and talking about gray man and and 
you know, alien abductions and and kind of psycho psycho psychological uh, stuff. But but what they don't want to talk about, and what 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 um, the commercial media didn't want to talk about when they also were picking that film that that um, series up as a feminist text is that Mulder is always right. It's never about cockroaches and people being, you know, allergic to cockroaches. It's never about teenagers having sex before they're ready to have it. It's always because there really was an alien abduction. And so there's a way in which a kind of investment in the, in the, um, patriarchy gets always rewritten back. I feel like that's what we've done with the final girl in a sense, that what we like about her is the kind of thing we see in Haute Tension, you know, this woman who's like covered in blood and she's muscle bound and she is standing there and she's ready to fight and God say, you know, God help you, you know, I mean, she'll take on the goddamn truck. Um, and we like that, but we don't like the idea of a, of a cringing man who is having a kind of masochistic pleasure out of watching mm -hmm. these films. I think, again, from that 2015 preface that Clover wrote in the uh, yeah. new edition, she's literally, you like the hero part when in actual fact she's the victim. It's the victim hero and we really need to italicize the victim part. I feel like, I mean, as a conclusion to a Slasher Studies conference, I feel like... Uh, Ending on Carol Clover is perhaps <laughs> ironic, given that, you know, repetition compulsion, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but you I'm, have to repeat it until you get it right. That's what's sad. <laughs> movie after movie, decade after decade, we're now into our fifth cycle and we just mm. cannot run away. But hey, we've achieved gender equality, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm conscious of the fact that it has already gone half past now, so we're running over time and I'm sure, well, I'm sure that... Uh, in the UK, everybody is definitely ready for bed. Um, but, but to um, uh, Wickham, Steve, Joan and Murray, thank you so much for um, presenting your papers um, at the conference, number one, but also agreeing to actually join us for a, an hour and a half of a very good conversation. And I definitely think it's um, really helped in terms of framing precisely where we're at right now and what are the most pressing matters in, in the study of slasher. Again, it really does become that question of studying slasher or slasher studies. Um, thank you, Steve, Murray, and Joan. Thank you both for organizing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank so you for much. Okay. Right. We well, are... I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll step in here as, as we sort of, we planned ahead of time and now it's uh, sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the end of the night, and we're muddling over each other. Um, I it, it was, that was a really fantastic conversation. And when we were planning the roundtable, Daniel sort of pitched it to me as we're making an argument for slasher studies, but uh, the roundtable is our peer review. Um, and yeah. and uh, you know, so I, I think it's been really useful to that end. Um, to the extent that the peer review is, uh, you know, giving us some really challenging things to think about and, and to take on board as we move into the future. That sounds really cheesy, but that's, that's sort of what we're kind of here to think about as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, to that end, um, We've had a lot of questions and, and, and uh, comments and feedback and people asking um, what's next for slasher studies. Uh, the, the main question is, is this a thing we're going to be doing every year? Um, and I keep saying, uh, ask us after we've gotten through the weekend. Um, <laughs> and it's going to be a one day symposium, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, let's talk about doing a one day symposium, uh, and, and then put out a call for paper. Yeah, that's, that's this it. weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, uh, th this uh, this one day symposium that turned into a massive three week, uh, three day conference uh, with so many good papers and wonderful insights and. Uh, it, intriguing and fresh perspectives to these movies that we, if we don't enjoy them, we enjoy talking about them and thinking about them at the very least. Um, so uh, to 
I, I guess to be sort of predictably tropey, uh, slasher studies um, isn't dead, or if it is dead, it will come back um, because we have very um, we have a very strong urge to do more with this, um, and uh, we just need to talk about like what some of those ideas are. We've got a few that are a bit vague, none solidified, but we do have ideas that we're going to be developing moving forward and uh so fingers crossed you won't hear the last from us um because the response has been so so phenomenal um that this seems to be something that people are getting a lot from and we want to continue giving you all a home uh for that um feel free to continue the conversation online, even though this is over. Um, and hopefully a lot of you have made, you know, new friends uh, and, and, uh, and, and met people that you can, uh, again, engage in these discourses with, because that's kind of the, the big benefit of, of all of this. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Daniel uh, to, to close us out. Um, I would also just say on top of what um, Wickham just said there, that, you know, we used, uh, we created the Twitter handle at Slasher Studies and we did create the website and it was for the conference itself. But I genuinely feel like whatever does happen, again, whether we create Slasher Studies or simply v we carry on the study of Slasher, um, the website and the Twitter account count will stay so whilst we don't have a gothic association we have slasher studies um i just wanted to end on some thank yous to people because um wickham and i feel that it's really important not simply to ask everyone here to simply just donate your money but i think you know with wickham and i have received so many thank yous but you know there's other people who have really i'm so sorry messages um but you know there are really people out there who have helped us make this conference happen um the first person that we really really dearly want to thank is professor vera Dika. um this conference would not be what it is without vera she is the one um number one who offered to give us her keynote in the first place which I know everybody found phenomenal but also she's the one you know who said let's let's get you in contact with Lloyd um, Kaufman and Ellen Lutter and John Newby you know we wouldn't have these industry panels if it wasn't for Vera and I feel like some of the insights that were mentioned during you know we we imagined the yesterday's industry panels plus keynote as a trilogy of sorts and we would have never been able to have that without Vera. So for the, you know, to Vera for not just giving us the keynote, but doing so much more, we are truly so appreciative. I don't know if she's watching now, but um, I hope that she uh, sees this on a stream sometime. Um, with this, obviously, we would also like to thank our industry speakers themselves, um, Lloyd Kaufman, Ellen Lutter, and John Newby, ASC. Um, Obviously, people, um, industry people often get uh, invited to talks, but not so much by the academic community. Um, so I'm sure that sometimes coming into the coming into these academic talks is a little bit different, but um, they were spectacular panels. And thank you so much for being gracious and um, giving time to us. With that, we'd also like to thank Steve Jones. Um, who was, of course, our keynote, but he also chaired and he participated in our roundtable discussion. And indeed, he's um, very recently a father. Um, so there's so much he's juggling around and to give us that time really, really means so much. Um, so thank you so much, Steve. With that, and, also... And, and, uh, sorry, and, and Murray, who's in the middle of moving as well to of move course. you into your next point who literally, I think, uh, provisionally the moving date was the date of this roundtable discussion, I believe, or something along those lines. So I don't think that happened in the end, but literally he was going to join us on the day that he was moving. And if that isn't dedication and doesn't say an essay about how great Murray is, I don't know what does. With that, of course, we also have Joan Hawkins, who joined us for our roundtable discussion. Um, and again, it, and again, not simply to have Joan as part of a roundtable, but again, to um, 
providers simply with a conference paper in the first place really genuinely mean so much to us. So thank you so much, June. Um, we'd also like to thank Miranda Ruth Larson, who um, somehow I have no idea what I'm doing with technology, nor does Wickham, and yet somehow we managed to do an entire virtual conference. Um, Miranda Ruth Larson has literally managed our Discord server, which is for the technological cool kids, um, allowing everybody to have a conversation with each other away from Twitter in a kind of more relaxed, chilled out environment. So um, if you're listening, Miranda, thank you so much. And we also really appreciate you live tweeting for us so much. We also have um, Josephine Maria Janasak um Janasak Leschinski. Um, she has been absolutely phenomenal in terms of live tweeting. As you can imagine, uh, me and Wickham have been very busy. And whilst we've been trying to tweet, it's always been retweets and likes because it's very difficult to juggle around. Um, to, so um, Josephine's been an absolute rock and really, really helped us in terms of uh, getting, not simply advertising the Slasher Studies summer camp, but literally getting the academic narrative on Twitter. Um, so it really does mean so much to us, Josephine. So genuinely, thank you. Um, and for that matter, I, I, I was genuinely going to scroll through every single person who had also live tweeted some of the panels and there was no way I was gonna go through it. So I really genuinely wholeheartedly wanted to provide a full list of people to mention within this stream. Um, but unfortunately I can't because um, I didn't have the time during any of the panels today, but to everybody who tweeted out and live streamed, everybody who got hashtag slasher studies, everybody who mentioned us, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. Um, we also wish to thank, again, very long list of people which we haven't had time to do. Thank you so much to everybody who's chaired a panel. Thank you to so much to everybody who's also um, delivered a paper for us. Obviously it's the weekend, um, a Friday to Sunday, conference at the weekend is a, a, a long one and um, you know balancing out things is difficult for people so we really do appreciate people taking out time for this and finally we really do thank you so much to everybody who has donated money like Wickham told me a provisional um, amount which I wish not to disclose yet but oh we did not expect it one little bit Ooh, and we cannot thank you enough for these donations. Um, when we said that we weren't going to do registration free fees and this was gonna be free, um, initially we thought, well, donations would be nice, but we didn't necessarily think people necessarily would um, substitute their money. And um, people's kindness, graciousness, and generosity is really, really shown. And from, again, I keep saying from the bo bottom of our hearts, it's not my bloody Valentine, so it's absolutely <laughs> fine. From the bottom of our hearts, um, thank you so much to everybody who has just been um, mentioned, whether by name or in spirit <laughs> within this stream. I mean, I, I also just wanted to add that, uh, you know, before we'd even announced that we were going to set up the the donation uh, money pool online, uh, we actually had people contacting us saying, you know, I, I see you're not doing registration fees. Is there a place that we can uh, donate for this? Which it just is a testament to the uh, to the kindness and generosity and wonderfulness of this community. You've, you've all been uh, a tremendous pleasure uh, to engage with. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit misty and I can't tell if it's because I'm really emotional or very tired. Um, but uh, it, seriously, you've, you've all been fantastic. And I thank you all for your help and engagement. Uh, I wanna say thank you to Daniel, um, who was the first person to contact me uh, about like, let's do a conference um, you know, one day symposium, uh, rather, uh, about slashers. And we, uh, had a bit of a chat about that. And he, like, we talk back and forth, we generate ideas together, and then he'd go and do it. And so much of the actual practical stuff that's going on now is, is thanks to Daniel, uh, in, in spite of me, uh, texting him occasionally to distract him, uh, about thinking about, uh, the brood in Kramer versus Kramer. Um, so 
Uh, yeah, uh, Daniel, uh, thank you for being a great person to work with here. Thank you all. Hopefully, it will will be back very, very, very soon. Um, okay. We'll we'll keep you updated. We'll make announcements. We'll update the the web page. We'll let you know about um, you know where we're going to put the YouTube streams and and so on and so forth. Uh, sorry a bit for running over, but I hope you at least enjoyed what we have. So thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Cheers. Slasher studies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Have a good sleep, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Thank you.